parent organization of over 200 men's clubs around the world, FJMC has presented more than 100 webinars since the pandemic began. We work hard to provide value to our members and to the Jewish community in general. For example, we provide a way for men to make friends who are not the spouses of, of our wise friends. If you were on a mission to make a new friend, where else could you go? If you had a million dollars and wanted to use it to find a new friend, you couldn't. You can't buy what FJMC offers. So I'm Dave Kravitz with Danny, Danny Mando, my, my co-chairman, and I'll be hosting tonight. We're gonna mute everybody so we can enjoy the presentation. We'll be unmuting later when you do the ch at the very, very end. Everything will be in the chats. If you're enjoying our webinars, please make a contribution to FJMC by going to fjmc.org slash donate. I'll, I'll put that link on the chat. It's now my pleasure to in introduce Alan Friedman. And I, this is, this is going to be a, indeed a pleasure. Alan earned a Bachelor of Arts from Fordham College and a Master's of Arts from Columbia University with honors in movement science and an emphasis in applied physiology. Alan is the director of the Jewish Sports Heritage Association, a not-for-profit education organization he started in 2015 with the goal of helping to educate the public about the role Jewish men and women have played and continue to play in the world of sports, an area of Jewish accomplishment often overlooked. Prior to creating JSHA, Allen was the founder and director of the National Jewish Sports Hall of Fame and Museum, a, a role he held for 23 years. Allen is currently the executive director of Temple Israel Lawrence, Long Island's oldest reform synagogue, and he has been in that role since 2015. Prior to that, he's been the associate executive director of the Suffolk YJCC in Carmack, New York, among the programs Alan was responsible for at the YJCC was the JCC Maccabee Youth Games. Suffolk hosted the regional games in 1995, and Alan was the competition's director and Suffolk delegation head at those games. Alan is married to Marilyn, who is manager at UBS in Weehawken, and is a proud dad of David and Rachel. We are going to show, so, uh, show a video in Stan Greenspan, who was a past international president of FJMC. He's gonna roll that for us. Uh, the video is fantastic. I've seen it, it's, it's gonna be great. You guys and everybody else who's watching it will really like it. So I'm gonna turn it over to my buddy, Stan Greenspan to show the video. Stan, it's all yours. The sound coming through? Yep. I'm Barry Landers, and welcome to the Jewish Sports Hall of Fame. Jews have made a major contribution to this country in every field of endeavor. And least known is a Jewish contribution to sports. From athletes to coaches, from executives to owners, from writers to broadcasters, Jews have played key roles in the evolution of sports in this country. In the 19th century, Jews enjoyed success in the sport of boxing in Europe. There were several no, Jewish champs, no, no, no. coming from England, including a great heavyweight champ by the name of Daniel Mendoza. Here in this country, the first pro baseball player was a Jew, Brooklyn native Lipman Pike, who played the outfield for the Philadelphia Athletics in 1866 and later played and managed until 1881. And would you believe one of the first great college football All-Americans was also Jewish. Phil King played halfback and quarterback at Princeton in the early 1890s, long before Benny Friedman at Michigan and Sid Luckman at Columbia. These sports figures are part of a long and proud Jewish tradition of sports in this country. And we've dedicated this video to all Jews who love sports. 
At the turn of the century, millions of immigrants came to America. Italians, Germans, the Irish, and a new wave of Jews from Eastern Europe. As they headed for Ellis Island to be processed, they passed Lady Liberty with the hope this country would bring a better future. While many Jews scattered to other parts of the country, others settled in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. The melting pot was taking shape, but the struggle for identity was even stronger. What happened was a lot of the uh, Jewish bounces started coming over, and uh, some of the tougher ones said, hey, this is the way I can make myself a dollar. But boxing was more than just that. Jewish boxers helped destroy the stereotype that Jews were just a people of the book, that they were weaklings and couldn't compete in physical sports. Jewish boxing heroes speeded assimilation and also provided the Jewish community a real sense of ethnic accomplishment. Randy Gordon knows boxing. At the age of 39, he was appointed the youngest boxing commissioner in New York State. Randy, a former editor-in-chief of Ring Magazine, has worked as a boxing analyst and commentator. My favorite, though, who boxed from about 1911 until about 1932, was a man who many say was the greatest fighter of all time, pound for pound, inch for inch, punch for punch. And the guy's name is Benjamin Wiener, who is known as Benny Leonard. There was also Barney Ross, Slapsy Maxie Rosenblum, and many others. But it was Benny Leonard who brought the most pride to the newly arrived Jew. Randy, let me tell you, there was a fighter by the name of Benny Leonard. He would whip anybody in his division. He could do it one-handed. He did it. And he went on. And just hearing Grandpa's stories, those were my first stories, hearing about Benny Leonard. And if it was good for my grandfather, it was good for everybody else in that community because it really gave them a sense of identity. Uh, one of their own, if you will, had really taken America by storm. Everybody was then talking about Leonard. A storm was also brewing in Germany in the 1930s, and no one could have imagined its consequences. <laughs> Margaret Lambert was a budding German track star at the time and a Jew. Yeah, it was just horrible. I mean, you could not do anything. You could not go in a restaurant. You could not, I couldn't train the stadium. Every public place was forbidden to Jews. So her father took her to a university in England where she might develop her track and field talent. They found me a pair of shorts. They couldn't find me shoes because nobody had big feet like me. And uh, I started to jump. And that was just the first time you know, for a long time, and I was just, I felt I could reach the, the sky. And so they immediately offered me a, a place on their track and field team, and I started to compete for them, won everything in sight. But one day her father told her she had to return to Germany. I didn't want to go back. I said, you have to go back. We were threatened. The government said, if you don't come back, well, you know, your family is, is at risk, and they wanted me to come back uh, to be the token Jew on their Olympic team. But the Germans did not expect her to equal the German high jumping record. And then in the middle of um, um, July, I got a letter that I wasn't good enough. And they couldn't find a space for you to, to compete in the Olympics. I was mad as hell, if I may use that expression. I was so upset. Uh, in a way, I mean, I really wanted to show, look at this lousy Jew, what she can do, you know, I wanted to show 100,000 people that uh, a Jew can do this. They, they wouldn't give me the chance. Margaret and her parents got out of Nazi Germany just in time and headed for America where Margaret went on to set other athletic records. If they had maybe apologized to me, I wouldn't feel quite so terrible. But this whole thing was just swept under the rug and that was the end of it. For sprinter Marty Glickman, the dream of being on the American Olympic team in 1936 had been realized. But what happened in Berlin may have become a recurring nightmare. Glickman, who went on to become one of the best broadcasters in the business, remembers. This is where I and the other athletes of the world sat in the stands and watched the events. And almost directly behind me, a little farther back, you can see the box where Adolf Hitler sat right there. I was a member of the 400-meter relay team here in Berlin to run the 400 meters against the rest of the world. 
The morning of the day we were supposed to run, we were called into a meeting, the sprinters were, and we were told by our coaches that they had heard the Germans were hiding their best sprinters, saving them to upset the American team in the 400-meter relay. I was a brash 18-year-old, out of my freshman year at Syracuse, and I said, Coach, in order to be a world-class sprinter, you must run in world-class competition. There's no way you can hide world-class sprinters. They said, nevertheless, we'll make the change. Jesse Owens and Ralph Metcalf will replace Sam Stoller and Marty Glickman. We were the only two Jewish athletes on the track team. We won the race by 15 yards. The Germans didn't finish second or third. They finished fourth. The America's 400-meter relay team with Owens, Metcalf, Draper, and Wyckoff lowered the world record to 39 and 8 tenths seconds. The fastest quartet of all time in a thrilling climax to the USA's track and field supremacy. I was very proud of my teammates. I said to myself, I should be out there. Sam Stoller and I, the two Jewish boys, because we made up the 400-meter relay, except the day of the race we were substituted for. Uh, very mixed emotions, mostly anger and frustration and bitterness. My thoughts now basically are that uh, I don't have a gold medal to show my, my grandchildren. I have 10 of those. Should have had that gold medal, of course, along with Sam Stoller. As a matter of actual fact, in the entire history of the modern Olympic Games since 1896, no fit American athlete in track and field has ever not competed in the Olympic Games except Sam Stoller and me, the two Jews. Jews have been involved in America's pastime since the early 1860s. In the early part of the 20th century, Jewish players played for several New York teams. In the 1920s and 30s, several Jewish players stood out, including Harry Danning, Andy Cohn, and Mo Burke. But the biggest star of all turned out to be a kid from the Bronx. Hank Greenberg played in the golden age of baseball with Detroit in the 30s and 40s. He was the first big Jewish baseball star and the first Jew in the Baseball Hall of Fame. Green Where's my... 331 career home runs, even though he missed five seasons because of military service. Hank Greenberg, now U.S. Army Private Number 36141611, goes to bat in his last big league baseball game for a year at least. And his final hit is a home run. Greenberg helped Detroit win the pennant last year has twice been voted the American League's most valuable player and has a lifetime average of 326. In 1938, he hit 59 home runs. Greenberg led the Tigers to four pennants and two World Series. He played with the Immortals Ruth, Garrick, Fox, Scaringer, Williams, and DiMaggio. The neighbors used to tell my mother they, that she had uh, four nice children it's too bad one of them had to be a bum. So that sort of summed up the way the, the orthodox uh, immigrant community in those days, in the 20s and late 20s, uh, viewed being a ball player. So it was inevitable that baseball and Judaism would clash. Pennant race with the Yankees, it was nip and tuck, and uh, along came the Jewish holidays. And it was a major event in Detroit, whether Hank would play on Rosh Hashanah. And uh, somehow someone finagled the... Uh, his way with the uh, chief rabbi of Detroit, who looked at the Talmud and, and, the, and the legal writings of the time and came up with a line that said that on New Year's Day, it was a day of celebration, and the children played in the streets of Jerusalem. So he was permitted to play on Rosh Hashanah and hit two home runs, and the Tigers won the game 2-1, to one, his second home run coming in the bottom of the ninth inning. Obviously, 10 days later, uh, when, when Yom Kippur came, there was no question, and he didn't play. If there was any anti-Semitism in baseball, Steve says it only made his dad a better player. Because he couldn't let up for a moment. Because if he did, there would always be some guy in the stands yelling at him, you sheeny bum. And he didn't like that. So he, he really said it made him bear down more than if they were just yelling, you bum. Uh, I think he was very touched that 30, 40, 50 years after he played his last game in Detroit, People who never saw him play would come up and ask for his autograph and say, you know, it means a great deal to me. 
what you did back in the 30s and the 40s, and we're very proud of you. While Greenberg was setting records in Detroit, Sid Luckman was revolutionizing football in Chicago. Drafted by the Bears in the first round, he became the NFL's first team formation quarterback under George Hallis. He played for 12 seasons, was an All-Pro six times, and was the league's MVP in 1943, leading the Bears to four titles. Basketball, the city game, where quickness and brains could often outwit size and brawn, had a great appeal to Jews. In fact, Jewish players and coaches and executives achieved more success in this sport than any other during the 20th century. Sid Tannenbaum was one of basketball's best players in the late 40s. He led NYU to the NCAA Finals and was named on several All-America teams. Max Zaslavsky, a former star with St. John's, played pro basketball for eight years, including a stint with the Knicks. Known as the Touch, Max led the NBA in scoring in 1947. When he retired in 56, he was the NBA's third all-time scorer. Nat Holman was the first Jewish player on the original Celtics who dominated pro basketball for a decade. He achieved great fame as a basketball coach later at the City College of New York, where he coached for 38 years. In 1950, CCNY became the only team to win both the NIT and the NCAA in the same year. Dolph Shays, a Bronx product, was an All-American at NYU in 1948. He starred with the Syracuse Nationals in pro basketball and was an all-star 12 consecutive years. When he retired, he held five NBA records, including the all-time scoring leader. He coached the Philadelphia 76ers later to an NBA championship. I mean, in my era, in the, in the 40s and 50s, there must have been 50 Division I Jewish basketball players. And the reason is very simple. We played the game. We, we played it all the time. The competition, we loved it. You know, if you go to Hope, Arkansas, it'll say, Bill Clinton lives here. At 2275 Davidson Avenue, it says, Dolph Shays lived here. I spray painted it myself. <laughs> what does that mean to you, that, that being honored that way? Goosebumps. I mean, that just to be, just to be part of that, uh, that, that group. I mean, Luckman and Greenberg and Koufax and Spitz and Ross and you know these wonderful, wonderful athletes. So, uh, you know, a lot of people say Jewish kids today are an athletic, but you know, I'm, I'm involved with the Maccabee movement, Maccabee games that go play in Israel. And we have also a Pan American games. I'll tell you, we've got some excellent players. There's some kids can really play. Maybe not NBA caliber, but they're very good players, not only in basketball, uh, but all sports, swimming, volleyball. You know, athleticism is, is, is alive and well in the Jewish community. There's time for everything. There's time for the books, and there's time for uh, the ball. And uh, it's part of life, and it's part of a good, well-rounded life. And uh, I think there's two tremendous opportunities out there for uh, skill for you know, Jewish kids like anybody else. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm all for it. And I think, you know, get the kids to the Jewish community centers and uh, get them started with basketball and, and, and support them. Go watch them play. Tell them, you know, you're doing good and all that stuff. That's very important. The support system uh, is very important. But to me, it was like chess. It was body chess, you know? It was uh, moving. You've got a certain number of arms and legs, and you were able to move them the way you move pieces on a chessboard. And the idea is to put the man on his back uh, just as a checkmate. It was in the world of amateur wrestling that Henry Wittenberg made his mark. In 1948, he won the gold medal as a member of the U.S. Olympic team. Well, I thought it would be the culmination of everything that I strove for. But it really wasn't. It just was another notch on the uh, on the gun, so to speak, about something that I had done because I just felt as though I had beaten the people who were there, and not the whole world. You know? In the 52 Olympics, he won the silver medal. In the 68 Olympics, he was the American wrestling coach. Wittenberg has also coached and competed in the Maccabea Games. It's unbelievable to have the kids from India, from Argentina, from all over the world competing together. And looking out into the stadium and seeing many, many thousands of people at Ramadan, and they knew they were all Jewish. <laughs> I never saw that before. Long Islander Art Heyman was a big star for Duke in the early 60s. He averaged 25 points a game, was a three-time All-American, and was the 1963 College Player of the Year. When he took a shot, 
Now, he was not the greatest shooter in the world, but he might have been one of the world's best at getting the ball back and sticking it back in. Heyman went on to be the Knicks' number one draft pick in 63, went on to play for a number of teams in a six-year NBA career. I think this is a greater honor than I received at my college, Duke University, when they retired my number at Duke. I'm a student and I'm an alumnus, but here it's tradition, it's blood, it's family. As Mr. Mason once said, I feel like a mensch being inducted into this Hall of Fame. Battling for it, Grunfeld gets it, lays it up there, good by Grunfeld. Past the line, lead past Grunfeld, he's got a shot, fake, in closer, 15 footer in the air, but I'm not. A Romanian born and New York bred Jewish basketball player who played for a Southern University power was Ernie Grunfeld. At 6'6", Grunfeld was a two-time All-American at the University of Tennessee and the all-time leading scorer when he left in 1977. Later, he was drafted by the Knicks and also played with Milwaukee. He worked as a radio analyst and as general manager of the Knicks. Now he is the successful general manager of the Washington Wizards. Well, I think my father gave me a great work ethic, and he told me, uh, I'll never forget this as a young kid, he said, work hard and good things are going to happen to you. Uh, being part of the Olympics is probably to this day winning a gold medal in 76 in Montreal. To this day, is probably the greatest accomplishment. Another Olympian, soccer goalie Shep Messing, was a two-time All-American at Harvard, the star player with the New York Cosmos. But his most memorable sports experience came as a member of the U.S. Olympic team in Munich in 1972. The peace of what has what have been called the Serene Olympics was shattered just before dawn this morning, about 5 o'clock, when Arab terrorists armed with submachine guns, faces blackened, a couple of them disguised as guards or as uh, trash men in the Olympic village, climbed the fence, went to the headquarters of the Israeli team, oh, wow. immediately killed one man. Moshe Weinberg, a coach, two shots in the head, one in the stomach. And I was awakened uh, at about 4.30 in the morning by a knock on my door and opened the door, and there was a German soldier with a gun uh, uh, asking for me by name and very quickly told me that there was an attack on the village and all the Jewish athletes on the U.S. team must come with the guards. The cruel irony was, for me was for Avery Brundage and the Gala Olympics to be going on. After we were released, while the hostages were still being held, and the hooded terrorist was visible 100 yards away, as the athletes from various teams strolled in the village, and the music played, and they played ping pong, while the terrorist was visible from 50 to 100 yards away, it was unconscionable and inexplicable. They've now said that there were 11 hostages. Two were killed in their rooms this morning, yesterday morning. Nine were killed at the airport tonight. They're all gone. Eddie, come on. That's better, Eddie. Keep those arms going. Keep those arms going. You're not going to beat anybody in the National League, you new backs skittle scattling around like that behind line of scrimmage. You see a little something, and if it isn't there, you make one cut and go. You might break the tackle. That's the way you do it in this league. Allie Sherman coached the Giants for a half dozen years in the 60s. He started out as a Brooklyn college quarterback, played with the Philadelphia Eagles of the NFL, but it was his no-nonsense coaching and astute football mind that is his claim to fame. Coaching the Giants was uh, coaching the Giants. Coaching was my, uh, my life, uh, and I loved it. And, and coaching the Giants was certainly uh, the major experience that I had. And uh, it was something that was most fulfilling. It's something that is fulfilling in the sense that we all have dreams, we all have aims, we all have goals, no matter what your business is. And you want to try to be the best. Born and raised in Brooklyn, Sherman says he was a city kid who played all sports all seasons. I found sports was, uh, was a great uh, uh, catalyst for me that moved me into the real world. And, but I did learn uh, a, a good deal in it about the different cultures and the relationships. And sports puts men together more so than anything else. It's a great interrelationship. They're out there on a competitive basis, on a performance basis, on a pressure basis. And that wipes away whatever you are, whatever faith you are. It's what you are as an individual. And I think young people can learn it faster with the use of sports ever. Also a Brooklyn product, Red Holtzman. Star basketball player at City College under Nat Holman, an All-American and an All-Star in the NBA. He coached the Knicks to NBA titles in 70 and 73.
Long Island native Larry Brown, despite his 5'9 stature, had a brilliant basketball career at the University of North Carolina. He won a gold medal on the U.S. Olympic team in 1964. Later in the old ABA, he coached the Denver Nuggets and Carolina Cougars to championships. He brought a winning attitude to UCLA and coached Kansas University to a national title in 1988. He also coached the Nets, Spurs, the Philadelphia 76ers, and is now the coach of the Detroit Pistons in the NBA. He is regarded as an outstanding strategist and motivator. You know, growing up, there were a lot of great Jewish athletes that I admired. Yeah. I never dreamed I'd have this opportunity to be selected in their company, but once again, thank you very much for honoring me in this way. This has been one of the most terrific World Series of all time, one of the most dramatic. And it was just a shame that one of these two teams had to lose. As the voice of the Yankees, Mel Allen is regarded as one of the all-time great broadcasters. His low-key and personable style brought the national pastime delight for millions of viewers and listeners. And that ball is going, going. And here we're going to give it all up to go into the, something like broadcasting. But I said, there's one catch. They want me to change my name. Well, that made it even worse. The supervisor at CBS was very kind about it. He said, if you come to work, we'd like for you to use a different name because not that we have anything against the name Israel, but you know, it's a little too all-inclusive. <laughs> and so all I did uh, was drop that and use my father's middle name, which was Alan. <laughs> For six years, Sandy Koufax was all too human, winning fewer games than he lost. Then from 1961 to 1966, he was without equal. He led the league in strikeouts four times, had the lowest ERA five times. He pitched four no-hitters, won 129 games, and three Cy Young Awards. All this before arthritis forced him to retire at age 30. Since then, he has protected his privacy the same way he protected a league fiercely, and with an uncompromising dignity. Sandy Koufax has all but disappeared. In 63, the Dodgers won the pennant and headed east to Yankee Stadium, where Mantle and Maris waited. Just going in the Yankee Stadium, it's the aura, or just the, the mystique of it. Uh, it's awesome, and it's overwhelming. With 25 wins and 306 strikeouts, Sandy dominated the National League. But these were the Yankees, winners of 104 games, owners of back-to-back -back World Series titles. In the first inning of Game 1, Sandy introduced himself by striking out the side. The Yankees batting now, the second inning, and the Dodgers lead him 4 to nothing. Here's Mickey Mantle. Mantle was right a good We started him off with one of the big curveballs. <laughs> Strike. And we hit him down here on the outside part of the plate with that good fastball. And he stepped out and he said, come on. He's supposed to hit that kind of stuff. Now the wind-up by Sandy. He delivers. It's a strike call. The fourth great strikeout for Sandy Koufax. Koufax looked into the Yankee dugout. And with that look, he was saying, I'm going to pitch it to your power, and I will still strike you out. The Yankees just left home plate shaking the hits. Uh, I don't think they had seen anybody pitch like that. I watched Sandy get 10, 11, 12. 13, 14. Sandy Koufax, who has tied Carl Erskine's record with 14 strikeouts, and was in one pitch, a break in it. Here's the 2-2 pitch to Bright. It's one on and misses. Look him out. Rosa, congratulate Koufax. Sandy's mastery of the Yankees made him a national figure. This wasn't the first time Sandy had taken a stand. He refused to pitch the first game of the 1965 World Series against the Twins. It was Yom Kippur. He spent the day in synagogue. The camera, the rolling in, the, the crowds are cheering, the rulers are waiting. But he had to draw a line on his sense of religion and dignity and heritage. He would not violate that even for the glory of a ball game. I thought that was one of the great statements 
in American athletics, I discovered that he was not necessarily a religiously observant Jew. And I asked him about it. I said, if you yourself didn't frequent the temple for services so often, why did you do it? And he said to me very humbly, I felt I was a role model for Jewish children. And I felt that it would be good for them to see somebody who respects himself. Uh, the Knicks and the Nuggets are coming up for Madison Square Garden, another Georgetown reunion. Marv Albert is one of the outstanding broadcasters of the modern era. He's displayed his diverse play-by-play -play talents with the Rangers, Knicks, and the NFL. Gary Bettman was appointed the first NHL commissioner. He spearheaded the league's successful expansion to Florida and Dallas and is responsible for the league's first network television contract in 15 years. I'm very, very supportive of the New York Jewish Sports Hall of Fame's goal of fostering Jewish identity uh, through sports. And as someone who has been fortunate enough to have a career in professional sports, uh, this particular honor, based on my heritage, is even more meaningful. And Fred LeBeau, the father of the New York City Marathon. And so these are the stories of struggle, of survival, and accomplishment. They are the Jewish Sports Hall of Fame. More than fame, their lives are lessons for us all. Why well, just be proud of who you are. Don't ever be ashamed of being Jewish. Remember your heritage. And don't ever forget where you came from. <laughs> You know, Jews haven't asked for too much during their history. They've asked that they not be victimized by ugly, unflattering stereotypes. They've asked that they be judged on their own accomplishments as individuals. And when you look at it, that's what makes athletics so special. It's only on the field of play people are truly judged as individuals. My success of being an athlete, I absolutely believe it is because I'm Jewish. And just like many of you in this room were motivated to prove you were as good as anybody else, so was I. Motivated to show we're as good as anybody else in the world that we grew up that was filled with prejudice. Our heritage of emphasizing education, family, contribution to the common good made us achieve way beyond our numbers. Well, if Jimmy had known his history, he'd have known that he could have named a lot of other people. You're seeing them here today, Colfax Greenberg, Al Rosen, Lyle Alzado, Dolph Shays, Benny Leonard, Maxie Rosenblum. We were well represented in sports. Yet, despite our considerable achievement in athletics in every possible field that you can imagine, True respect and universal admiration did not come to our people until we proved ourselves capable of founding and defending a nation. In my lifetime, I've seen anti-Semitism decrease dramatically, and in no small part, it's because of Israel, a warrior nation that captured the imagination and admiration of the world with the Six-Day War, the Yom Kippur War, the Raid on Entebbe. And some of you are old enough to remember. Remember you'd be in an elevator, you'd be in a restaurant, you'd hear people talking about some trouble spot in the world. Didn't it fill you with pride when somebody, you'd hear somebody say, yeah, they ought to send Israel over to clean up that mess. <laughs> Nor did most of you realize the future of American Jews is tied to the survival of Israel. The ability of our children and our grandchildren to grow up comfortable in America is tied to the survival of the state of Israel. And conversely, the survival of the state of Israel is tied to organizations like this, which teach and foster pride in, in our heritage and our Jewish identity, because you in turn then do things to support Israel. He was a great believer in education. Yes, play sports, do the best you can. But even if you're a terrific athlete, even if you have a professional career, don't ignore the other side of your life. So if you get interested in the sport, stay with the sport. But don't think about what you can get out of it. Think about what you can put into it. And you'd be surprised what you get out of it. Well, you know, it's a great honor to be a, uh, a role model to the young Jewish community. 
uh, to the young community at large, uh, but especially the young Jewish community. Uh, you know, I, I've come back up here to the Jewish Sports Hall of Fame and uh, been able to meet so many young uh, kids uh, that come to the ceremonies. Uh, you know, I would say to any young athlete, uh, young Jewish athlete growing up, is to chase your dream. Uh, to live it out every day, to work for what you want to accomplish, and uh, don't let anyone get in your way, uh, whether it be through prejudice, whether it be uh, you know through people not allowing you uh, to do anything, or whether it be you know any other uh, barrier that's that's out there. Oh, I feel so proud to be a, a Jewish athlete, and uh, to see that there are so many up-and-coming Jewish athletes out there. Uh, to, uh, what I found. Uh, in my travels from team to team, and I've been on many different teams and played with many different uh, athletes, is that uh, most of them want to learn more about uh, the Jewish heritage. And, and I've been fortunate enough to be able to, to pass, upon, pass upon my knowledge of what it is to be Jewish and, and uh, uh, what it's like to grow up uh, you know, with the, the Jewish religion. And, you know, I think it's really been, uh, you know, a great feeling to be able to, to open a lot of teammates' eyes uh, and a lot of other people uh, and kind of teach them about, uh, you know, our heritage. And, and uh, it was great to see that uh, my teammates really wanted to learn about uh, where I came from. And so as we watch these young and dedicated Jewish athletes, we may be looking at the sports heroes and Hall of Famers of the 21st century. Athletes who will continue a proud tradition. We hope you've enjoyed our presentation of Jewish sports legend. Oh. All right, that was that was incredible. I, I really enjoyed that, Alan. I really, really did. It David, was, I, it was you know just you're so proud to be Jewish when you see that and. Um, Learned a lot of new things about um, big athletes are a big thing. I'm not an athlete at all, but watching, uh, I'm a, I watch Jewish sports and I draw any sports I can watch. And um, it's just amazing to see that. So uh, very, very proud of that and very proud of you for doing that. That is quite an Thank you. So I'd like um, to, to start. I should, I, I should mention a couple of things. First off, thank you very much for your very gracious introduction. Thank you to Stan for running that. I know if I were trying to run it from my end, the video would have stopped five minutes into it. So um, I think everyone should know, by the way, that the president of um, US Sports for Israel, the Maccabee Games, Jeff Bukans, is on this call. And um, I don't know if Jeff ever saw the film, but there was quite a lot of Maccabee information in there. Um, because we started with the film, I want to talk a little bit about that and then talk about Jewish sports heritage and, and why we're doing what we're doing. We made the film um, after being in the business, so to speak, for about five years. Uh, you'll see from tonight how wonderful a speaker I am, but we realized particularly when we were in groups like this or in religious schools, there needed to be something visual for everybody to see to get the history of the Jewish experience in sports. And we put the film together uh, to give you an idea what happened. We had two days where we went around the New York area and interviewed people, whoever was available. Uh, you saw them, Steve Greenberg, Henry Wittenberg, Shep, um, Randy Gordon. And for the most part, they were uh, in Barry Landers. Barry was the uh, chairman of our advisory committee and he was the master of ceremonies every year for the Jewish Sports Hall of Fame inductions. And I learned a little bit. I was the producer and, and screenwriter of the film uh, along with him. Uh, we were in his apartment in the city and we just changed backdrops. So Shep would be in front of one backdrop then Henry went into the bedroom or whatever. Um, but we had two days that we could film. As a matter of fact, we were supposed to interview the retired coach of the Knicks, Red Holtzman, and his wife Selma took ill and we were lucky enough to get Ernie Grunfeld who at the time was the next general manager. Uh, so he sat for an interview with us. Um, so about five years ago, we edited the movie. Um, we edited some footage of inductions, including what you saw there with Ron Mix, the football hall of famer, which may be the best piece I've ever heard in terms of what it means to be a Jewish athlete and what sports means to Judaism overall. 
um, and it was a great piece. And, and he used that again this past year when we were at, and Jeff was there as well, at the uh, anti-Semitism symposium at Fordham University. And this is a guy, so everyone understands, not only is he in the Football Hall of Fame, but he's a labor lawyer. So again, I'm not stressing, the organization isn't stressing athletics over academics. You heard several people say this, including Steve Greenberg, that it makes a well-rounded life, academics, athletics, and the other things you do. If you have the ability to make it as a professional athlete, that's great, but that's not what we're saying. We want you to look at a well-rounded, all-purpose life, not just focusing in on sports. Um, why did we start? Again, this goes back originally to the National Jewish Sports Hall of Fame. In the early 1990s, I was working, it was called the Suffolk Y back then, it wasn't the Suffolk Y JCC. Um, I was the health and phys ed director and one of the board members came to myself and the executive director and he wanted to know if there was something that we can do to educate the public and in particular, Jewish kids to let them know about the role that Jewish men and women have played in sports. Um, if you think of the movie Airplane, there's a scene with the passenger asks for some light reading material and the stewardess comes with the smallest pamphlet ever created, Jewish sports legends. And that was kind of the thing that got me going. Um, my background is in history and I happen to like sports, not just Jewish sports. And it triggered something with me, the idea that we were gonna create a hall of fame and use it as an educational tool. Um, the Suffolk Y has a very large fitness area and we were gonna take a little section and make a hall of fame. I mean, put up some pictures and biographies, something like that. Um, again, this was like 1991, 1992. I made some calls. This is before the days of the internet. And I found out that there was gonna be a New York Jewish Sports Hall of Fame. And I was talking to their director to be, and I said, you know, I'm, I'm a phys ed guy, what do I know? I'm looking at the map of Long Island and Queens and Brooklyn are attached. So that means we should be able to include them. We'll be a Long Island Jewish Sports Hall of Fame. And he hung up the phone on me. Uh, so, okay, so we started and we were the Long Island Jewish Sports Hall of Fame. Our first induction was in 1993. There are three criteria and we still use them to this day. And uh, I tell people, number one, and this is probably the most difficult, uh, it sounds easy, but it really is. And I've been doing this for 25 years, give or take. We want the individual that we're looking at, and I'm going to say athlete, but it's athlete, coach, executive, broadcaster, et cetera. They consider themselves Jewish. Um, there are periodicals like Jewish Sports Review that I refer to. They're my mavens. There's a couple of different people who know this subject very well, Jews in Sports used to be a very good site. Uh, Martin Abramowitz, who put the Jewish major leaguers together and knows baseball better than anybody, Jewish baseball better than anybody. Uh, Bob Wexler, whose book I'm gonna to refer to in a little bit. Um, but they do something that's a little bit different and they'll say the mother is Jewish, the father is Jewish or both parents are Jewish. But I have learned because I've spoken to certain athletes that have been honored by some of these organizations when I talk to them, they're like, I don't consider myself Jewish. And that to us is extremely important. We don't ask whether or not the person um, was bar or bat mitzvah or went to religious school, but they consider themselves Jewish. So um, I've gotten to some arguments with people on the subject. Um, there's a question I'm gonna ask later, but I'll save it in terms of the Baseball Hall of Fame. So you understand that that's first and foremost what we're looking at. The second criteria is whatever the sport or as a broadcaster or executive or whatever that the person is involved with, they achieved a significant level in their sport. Uh, when we first started, nobody knew who we were, what we were trying to do, and we really need to make a name for ourselves. So we went after very big names. Our first year, induction 1993, you may look at it um, and say, wait, you have Sandy Koufax or what did he have to do with Long Island? And I don't know how, how well you folks know Long Island, um, but I knew for a fact that he used to get his gas out in Comac, not too far from the Y. Um, I know you're muted, but that was pretty funny. As um, a youngster, everybody I think probably knows that he was from Brooklyn, he went to Lafayette High School. 
but there was a period of time where the family moved to Rockville Center, which is on the south shore of the island. Uh, his dad was um, taking the train, the LIRR, to work in the city. And I believe there were two separate incidents where there were train derailments and the dad said, we're going back to Brooklyn, it's a lot safer. Um, so he is known for being from Brooklyn. But um, the third criteria, and this is the one we've kind of eased up on over the years is, and you heard uh, Jay Fiedler when he was talking, he came up for several induction ceremonies. We hold them on Sunday mornings. We do that because we want kids to attend if possible with their parents, grandparents. Um, we want them to hear the stories of these men and women. We want them to meet the athletes. Uh, if they just want to get an autograph, that's, that's fine too. But we want them to see what these men and women have done in the world of sports. And we would ask the person if possible, could they attend the induction ceremony if their health permitted. And we found over the years that people that were up front with us when I would ask usually late summer, early fall for the induction ceremony that spring, people would say, I can't commit or I can't do it. And then we would say, great, then we'll consider you for another year. Then somebody else would come along and they'd say, oh, I can attend the induction ceremony. And by the time we got to the April induction, they're like, I can't make it. And we're honoring the person uh, who couldn't attend where maybe the other person might have been able to. So over the years, we've kind of relaxed that rule and we say, if you can attend, that's great. We would really like it that you're there, but we understand if you couldn't be there. Um, this year, the induction ceremony will be in April and it's probably gonna be like this on Zoom. So I would think most of our honorees will be able to attend. Um, so that gives you the idea of what we're looking at uh, in terms of who we would consider. I'm gonna say, because actually some of the guys who registered for the program, uh, I'm assuming they're on, uh, they may ask me this later if they are, but they mentioned athletes, if I knew this boxer or this basketball player, and I said, yes, I did. And I know that there are quite a few Jewish greats in the world of boxing and in the world of basketball that over the years we have not inducted. Um, that's something I hope my committee and I will rectify. Maybe we'll have an old timers group that will induct a few um, each year as opposed to like one person. Um, but there are quite a lot of people and those two sports in particular, Jews in the early part of the 20th century dominated. Um, so when we started, as I said, we were the Long Island Jewish Sports Hall of Fame. The one in New York never opened their doors. So between 1993 and 1994, we became the New York Jewish Sports Hall of Fame. To this day, I can still remember one of the past presidents at the Y sitting at a board meeting saying, look, you already ran out of Jewish athletes in one year. And I didn't think it was that funny then. Then I wish I could tell you how many years went by, but it was probably about another 12 or 15. And we found out that the B'nai B'rith Klutznik Museum, which had a section devoted to Jewish sports, they were closing that section up and we decided we were gonna become the National Jewish Sports Hall of Fame. My executive director at that time got a call from the director of the International Jewish Sports Hall of Fame, the ones who started this all in Israel, wanting to know if we were gonna go international. We laughed and we told them, you know, this, this was a sideline for us. We, we're not making money doing it. It's another program at the time of the Suffolk Y. And we're like, no, we're not going international. We weren't even looking at Canada. Sorry, Stan, nothing against Canada. We weren't looking at Central or South America. We were focusing in on the United States. Okay. Um, 19, whatever that was, late 1990s. I was at the Y until 2013 and things changed financially. I'll give you the very short version. Um, jobs were terminated. I was one of two associate executive directors. Both of us were eventually told there was no longer a position. So my leaving meant there was no longer a Jewish Sports Hall of Fame, I'm sorry to say. They ran one more induction ceremony in 2014. Um, and I'm not even so sure uh, that their website is up and running. In 2015, I just felt that this was something that had become such a part of me and was too important in terms of the educating the public that I started Jewish Sports Heritage Association. The same idea, educating the public, um, having a website, a Facebook page. I'm not so good on Twitter. 
and I do not have an Instagram account. Um, but if you go on Facebook, you will see every day I have postings. And one of the things that I do is I utilize this book by um, Bob Wexler. And really, if you're as nutsy about this as I am, it's every day of the year, what happened? And I just had to pick this up because tomorrow, January 21st in 1948, a basketball player by the name of Al Friedman of the Mohawk Redskins scored 14 points. Wasn't me. I'm old, but I'm not that old. So, uh, and as I said, Jewish Sports Review is a great resource. For example, this was their most recent issue and it's the football issue. They cover the NFL and they also look at Jews who are playing high school and college as well. They have a section on other sports and it's very good in terms of if you want to learn a little bit more. Um, and in the back, for example, this particular issue, they list every Jew who ever played in the NFL. Another good source, if you're interested, this is actually the most recent copy of the book that the International Jewish Sports Hall of Fame put out. However, and I am not knocking them for what they do. This is an amazing thing to, to this is the fifth edition. And believe me, I know, because I, I, I've done these things in terms of updating. Um, but they have people in there, as I said before, who I've spoken to and, and they don't consider themselves Jewish. Um, they have Max Baer in there. You've got to understand, I grew up a fan of the Beverly Hillbillies. I don't know what that says for me. Um, but part of the reason I like the show is my brother had told me that Jethro, that Max Baer's father was Jewish and was the heavyweight champion of the world. We had uh, the boxing historian and writer Max, um, excuse me, Bert Randolph Sugar come to one of the induction ceremonies. And I don't remember who the reporter he referred to, uh, but he talked about Max and one of his fights. And he said he came out of the shower having just seen Max in the shower. And he told people who were there, he's like, um, I just saw Max and I can tell you he's not Jewish. So I leave it at that. Um, I know Max fought with a Jewish star on his trunks, but again, boxing was, the sport when he fought and he wanted the support of the Jewish community. I believe, I don't remember all the details. Um, there was a grandmother who was Jewish, but again, he himself was not. I've gotten into discussions with a certain sports writer and I'm not trying to embarrass him, um, but he told me that Lou Boudreau, the great baseball hall of famer was Jewish, but Boudreau was raised by one parent who was not Jewish and the other parent was the one who was. Again, if you want to go by parentage, that's one thing, but that's not what we look at. When it comes to the issue, if we are not sure of somebody, if that person is alive, I try and reach out to them to find out. As I said, I have spoken to people. Um, if they're not, we try and get a hold of family. You heard uh, Shep and Jim McKay when they were talking about the 1972 Olympic massacre in Munich. Um, I had read and some of our committee had read that Howard Cosell was very upset to say the least after those games and he no longer considered himself Jewish. Whether you liked him as a broadcaster, the man made a tremendous impact on sports and we just weren't sure if he was Jewish and we would induct him. I was able to find his grandson who put me in touch with his mother Howard Cosell's daughter, she and I had a great conversation and she told me in no uncertain terms he was Jewish throughout his life. When we were talking about inducting Warner Wolf, a uh, rumor came around that he was a Jew for Jesus. Uh, light bulbs went off in my head. I was like, I'm not inducting a Jew for Jesus. I was able to get a hold of Mr. Wolf and he said he had heard that rumor too, was not true. Um, so that again, we're not going to induct or honor somebody if we're not sure they consider themselves Jewish. Um, I think in terms of the time, David, you yeah. wanted me to talk for about 20 minutes. So I guess now uh, we'll look for questions. Okay. Um, it was fantastic. I, I've learned so much. Um, Danny, do you want to, there's some questions from the chat we can, uh, we can do. There's a lot of um, stuff there about <laughs> Koufax and the Dodgers, I see. Yeah. Um, a lot of it's just comments. There was a good question. I just have to find it. If you give me one minute. Kofax, Kofax, Kofax. He didn't attend service. Okay, hold on, hold on. Uh, 
Is Mark Spitz Jewish and so, and if he is, is he in the hall? Yes, to both. Yes, and both. Ron, is Ron Bloomberg? Oh, I remember him growing up. I was a yes. Mets fan. Yes. Okay. Ron and Bloomberg. we had him actually as a speaker a few months ago. He's a very nice guy. He and Art, we had Art Chamsky in person. Yeah, and Art Chamsky. Ron, right. And I know Ron Bloomberg and Art are doing programs together. Uh, but Ron is a real character. Nice guy. They're both nice guys. Very nice guys. We tried to get, I live up here in the Boston area. We tried, I, I spoke to Art Shamsky and, and he told me how much he wanted to charge. Yes. Um, then, <laughs> everything, everything with Art is money. I'm sorry to say. I love him dearly. And then we're in Boston. So, you know, I grew up in the New York area. So to me, it was a big deal. But the guys were just like, who? No. Yeah. So... <laughs> Uh, uh, let's I, have, see. I have a question. Maybe people want to answer it in the chat room. So, with, wait, we got this. Uh, Are there any Jewish hockey players? Yes. Um, hockey is not my sport. The only one that comes to mind right now is a Ranger, and we're honoring him with our college athlete. We, we lost last year in, as an induction ceremony because of COVID-19, uh, Adam Fox. Uh, but you also have the Hughes brothers, um, the number one draft choice this past year. A nice Jewish boy and his brother, I think, is actually playing better than he is. I'm going to say Quinn, but I don't follow hockey too well. Uh, maybe the best, most recent hockey player, and now he's involved with the Players Association, is Matthew Schneider. I have one here from Hi, Dave. Hi, Buller played hockey for the New York. Yeah, well, you're ta I'm trying to talk about more current, yes. I have a, a question here from Dave Roberts. Please mention about the book signing. He had at his temple for the city game about the CCNY basketball point shaving event. It was a great event. Yes, it was. And we had Matthew Goodman, the uh, author at our temple as well. And I wish I could remember his name. Maybe Mr. Roberts does. But the, the last living player on that CCNY team was in attendance because he lives on Long Island. Um, very, very well written book. I was actually, um, there were times towards the end, and I told this to Matthew, the book. Yeah, I'm yeah. the tears uh, with what happened yeah. with some of the players and, and, and uh, coaches on that team. But an excellent book. You don't have to be a sports fan. Um, it was very good because I was into it as well. Uh, my late father was a CCNY graduate when CCNY was considered, you know, the, the Jewish man's Harvard. And, um, you know, just what it was like for a kid. For, well, my dad was from the Bronx, the kid from New York City to go to CCNY and then bringing in everything else that was going on in terms of basketball. And remember, back then, the college game was the big game, not the professional game. Um, but I highly recommend the book to, to people. It's an excellent read. I believe my temple president, Dr. Doug Segan, is on this. And he read the book, and he'll tell you he's not a sports fan. And it was just a really well-written book, well-researched book. Uh, Red Auerbach is in the hall. Barry Beck of the Rangers was not Jewish. Um, Green is on the Canucks, Jack on the Devils. Right. Alan, uh, there, yes. there's two hockey, there's two Jewish hockey players I know of. One is Bernie Wolf, who was a goalie for the Washington yep. Capitals, and the other is Jeff Halpern. I'm not yep. sure what position he played, but he Jeff also played. is. Um, now that's a very good question uh, statement because Jeff is one of our inductees this year. Um, Jeff played for the Capitals. He was a, a top player when he was at Princeton, and again, you're talking about the academics as well as the athletics. And he was a coach for Tampa who just won the Stanley Cup this past season. Um, to try and get a hold of him is not the easiest thing, um, but whatever. Bruce Beck from Livingston, New Jersey. Yes, Bruce is a nice Jewish boy. We know him well. Uh, he's been very involved with us. If you understand, um, and I try and explain this, Zach Hyman is Jewish, but uh, he also wrote some children's books. Um, Marty Glickman. A lot of people, maybe there's a lot of you in attendance who know Marty as a broadcaster, but Marty, think of it, an 18 year old, and he was one of the four fastest men in the world, told the day of his event, he and Sam Stoller are not competing. There was no Olympics in 1940 or 44, and after the war, and he served in the war as a Marine, he wasn't running anymore, and he became a broadcaster, and Marty focused in on um, the New York area. I think pretty much every team in New York, uh, he broadcast for it. But Marty was an educator and he taught whether it was Bruce, Len Berman, Bob Costas, Marv Albert, 
the other Alberts. Um, Bill Walton had an issue with a stutter and Marty helped him work through that. So he became a broadcaster uh, for the National Basketball Association. Um, but Marty, it was a very moving ceremony. One of the members of my committee, our committee, reached out to the uh, president of the Olympic Committee at the time, a gentleman by the name of William Hibble. And he, he had said he had been a prosecutor in Colorado where the Olympic Committee is headquartered. And he said, looking at all the evidence, he goes, to me, it looks like you and Sam Stoller were not allowed to compete because you were Jewish. And this was whatever, 45 years after what happened to them. And he apologized on behalf of the Olympic Committee and he presented them, well, Sam was posthumously, but he, Marty was there and they presented him, they created the Douglas MacArthur Service Award. Again, a little bit of trivia, General MacArthur was the first in the United States Olympic Committee. Now, if you know Marty and he's in the same category as Ali Sherman and Mel Allen, um, they talked and talked and talked. They make me look like Marcel Marceau. I mean, they just, <laughs> they, they talked. And Marty gets up there after Hibble made his speech and he goes, what took you so long? And that was it. Um, so um, yeah, Mike Hartman, by the way, we inducted Mike. He was a part of the Rangers when they won the Stanley Cup. Um, question, and I guess you gotta go in the chat room. So what I started to say earlier is you have four teams that are in the, the NFL championships. Now, I'll give you this one because he can't play right now because of a back injury. Mitchell Schwartz is an all pro lineman on the Kansas City Chiefs. And who knows what's gonna happen with Mahomes. So Buffalo, I, I gotta root a little bit for Buffalo. I'm, and I'm sorry, I'm, I digress here. One, because it really is the only New York football team. I'm sorry. You know, everybody else seems to play in East Rutherford, New Jersey. Um, and my son lives in Buffalo, so I'm rooting for Buffalo. I have nothing against Kansas City, but Mitchell is injured. But there is one Jewish player left playing and actually had a very good year. Does anybody know who that is? And I'm not telling you what team, and I can tell you it's not Aaron Rodgers. Does anybody know who the Jewish player is who will be competing? I will hey. tell you. Are there any Jewish players playing this weekend? Football? Yeah. Any okay. Jewish players playing this weekend? But you, got a, you got a resource there? <laughs> yeah, my son, but he doesn't know. He doesn't know? Forgot it. If he doesn't right. know, no one knows. Okay. Um, he's protecting uh, Mr. Brady's back. Ali Marpet on the Buccaneers, oh, wow. his lineman, was actually all pro this year. Wow. Uh -huh. And he, I, he came from Hobart. He came from a Division three school. Wow. Um, do a I, baseball oh. question. Um, do you guys know who the winningest left-handed pitcher in Major League history, Jewish, is? Holtzman. Holtzman. Very good. You were Thank correct. You. I was Thank a Mets you. fan. No Did longer, you? but I won. OK. <laughs> uh, we have what a good question here for you Rick from Mo. No, not Jewish. Uh, Mo, Mo from New England, uh, from, from this region, would uh, like to know where he could, uh, I have to find this question again, but where are you? Are you on the website? How can you find out? Okay. Um, the biggest difference between National Jewish Sports Hall of Fame, which grew and actually took over most of the why, at least when I was there, is a physical presence. There is a brick and mortar Hall of Fame we're online, jewishsportsheritage.org. We're also on Facebook. I do a lot more on Facebook, as Dr. Segan would say. Uh, my, my website, our website is, eh, um, it could be better. Um, we're, uh, yes, Lyle Alzado is Jewish. That's one of the most interesting things, I digress. You can't go by names. One of our inductees this year, for Dave in Worcester, is a Boston Red Sox who is Jewish. There you, go. you know who I'm referring to. Okay, I got to think about that. You his huh? brother, yes. I was going to say close. his brother-in-law oh, is Tom Brady. How do you not know? Kravitz. Yeah, I'll say Are that. You sleeping? Are you sleeping? My guy. Married to Tom Brady's uh, sister. Yeah. Yes. And has a, well, now with COVID, I can't say how successful he was, but my, my son and I 
are into craft breweries and he has a craft brewery out in Loma Linda. Sean Green didn't really consider himself Jewish. I don't know, you know, this could be a whole discussion for another time. I talked to somebody one day and they tell me one thing, uh, Amari Studemeyer, a couple of years ago, he's not Jewish. Now he is Jewish. Who knows? Uh, whatever. Do I work with? Thank yes. You can um, actually in Philadelphia and San Francisco, when they were first starting, they had contacted me um, and I helped them with a lot of the background stuff. Michigan is Michigan. There, there may be uh, the best one in the United States. They do a tremendous amount of fundraising um, and they do a lot of great individual awards. Uh, we did induct Andre Tippett. When Andre Tippett shook my hand, it was like that scene from Animal House with, with the women, you know, can we dance? And I put my hand in his, you gotta understand this man is a black belt in karate, nicest man. Just got inducted into the football, uh, college football hall of fame along with another Jewish player, Harris Barton. Uh, but we inducted Andre Tippett already. Brad Ausmus, we inducted, um, he didn't attend the ceremony because of a problem uh, with a baseball, with a current baseball player at the time. I, don't, I think he was still playing, it was before he was managing. It's baseball season, we're April. So we get a lot of the other sports, but unless they're a retired baseball player, the current ones we don't get. Um, Rod Carew never converted, thank you. I'm glad somebody knows that because I always trick up people when I say, name me the Jewish uh, people in the Baseball Hall of Fame. There's only two players and there are two executives. No, there'll be three executives now. Rod Carew's family uh, was raised Jewish. The daughters were raised Jewish, but he did not convert. Okay, we're gonna take one more question and then we're gonna wrap it up. Okay, what's the question? Whoever has, um, Danny, you got one there? Oh, um, no. No, okay. Uh, uh, Biznawadi and Karimi aren't playing right now. They're out. Gabe was our college athlete of the year, his senior year at Wisconsin. Carew is not considered Jewish. Oh, there's a lot more players in the NFL. You guys were asking me about hockey. You were trying to trick me. You know, I, I agree with you that Carew is not Jewish, but I, I remember a picture. Okay. Welcome very much. All right. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to end this now. And um, first of all, uh, I want to thank my uh, coach chairman, Danny Mando, um, Elliot Feldman. Elliot, are you on the call right now? Because Elliot's our coach chairman. Yes. Okay, Elliot, Elliot's going to say a couple of words and then I'm going to continue. Elliot? Uh, well, it's not really a couple of words, but first off, what a great program. Thank you guys for pulling this together. Hey, everybody kind of like clap, you know? There you go. There you go. All right, um, and thank you to the coaches. What a great job they're doing in terms of all the great sp sports programs. So my club in Sharon, Massachusetts is actually running a program and they would like to invite all of you guys uh, to participate. It'll be another Zoom one. It's, um, it's Mike Reese, who's um, a, a SBA, ESPN reporter, and he's talking about the Patriots, but he's gonna talk about uh, reflections, observations in Super Bowl uh, 55 season under COVID and what to look ahead. So if you're interested in, in uh, getting on that list, I'm going to send you right now, I'm going to send you my email and just send it back to me. Okay, very good. All right. I so say one quick thing since you mentioned it, sure. maybe I'm giving away a secret and you might already know it. Andre Tippett lives in Sharon. Yes. Well, yeah, I know that. Okay, yeah, I, we could go on forever here. Okay. Uh, I, Andre Tippett, so you, you can't do you, that. Okay. You brought so, him up. So, so I've also had the pleasure of many, many times having Andre Tippett because the crafts are members of my shul. So every grandchild, and I'm one of the head ushers, so every time I offer him hagba, because he's a big guy, you're absolutely right. The guy's hand is like, oh my God. <laughs> All right. So um, thank you. Now, I just want also want to thank our IT maven, uh, Stan Greenspan, our one of our past international FJMC uh, presidents did a phenomenal job because I couldn't even figure out how to do this to save my life, as, <laughs> as Danny knows. Okay, so, and I also, for, and I want to thank everybody for the program for joining this evening and a special thank you to our speaker, Alan Friedman. He was absolutely fantastic. Um, 
wonderful program. I enjoyed everything about it. Um, of course, I'm a sports nut, so that was part of the course for me. So in honor of your presentation this evening, the FJMC is pleased to plant a vine in Israel as part of our partnership with Wine on the Vine, an exciting new program from the Israeli Israel Innovation Fund, a nonprofit foundation that supports Israeli wine industry, arts and entertainment, and the FJMC. Our next event of the Sports Affinity will be on February 10th. Our program will be Marshall Einhorn. He is the Chief Executive Officer of Maccabee USA. I would not miss that. Be sure you're on that program. If you're interested in presenting or to help plan a program, please contact me at dbkravitz at msn.com or my phone number 508-735-9538. Thank you. I look forward to seeing you at our next program. And if you enjoyed our program this evening, please make a contribution to FJMC by going to fjmc.org slash donate. The link is in the chat. Thank you very much. Shalom. And thank you, David Kravitz, for pulling this together you, once again. My, my thank you, all. And thank my you, pleasure. Alan. Thank you very, very much. You're very welcome, David. All right, thank hopefully we'll all. see a lot of you guys tomorrow night with our cooking webinar on Sholink. Can't wait. I'm all right. Forward. Good night, everyone. Right, good night, will everyone. this be available thank to uh, rewatch? Thank yes, you. Yes, I will post it on the YouTube, FJMC YouTube page, where I've been posting all of them. Excellent. Out. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm glad you asked. Actually. Thanks, Danny. Just, uh, 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 Danny, Danny? Yes, sir. Do we have permission to post the video? Excellent question, Mr. Suda. We'll find out. Just, uh, <laughs> I'll send I him know. an email. I want to send him yeah, an email. Just, I, I don't, I, uh, I, we probably do. I just want him to get, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good. yeah. When I send him the vine, I'll send him a question. Yeah, I'll send him the email, Danny. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye.